All right. Well, listen, welcome everyone uh, to Resolving Class Actions and Mass Claims in 2021. My name is Lance Harkey. I'll be serving as your moderator and occasional participant. Uh, we're grateful that you're here today. We appreciate that your time is short and uh, we're going to spend an hour with you uh, to go over how to uh, resolve class actions and mass claims and an insider's perspective. And there's no greater insider uh, for us to have today than uh, Rodney Max, who's here to um, speak for a few minutes about class actions and introduce the uh, seminar. So I'll turn this over to Rodney. Welcome. Thanks, Lance. I appreciate it. I, I really appreciate those attending. Uh, what's, what's unique about this area of class and mass actions and the mediation process is that it is all over the country. It's not limited to any one state, any one region, any one court. Many times we have uh, actually competing courts, but it is national in scope and so is our audience. So I thank you. I, I know over the years we have all worked together in one form or, or fashion in different cities uh, trying to resolve class actions uh, of numerous kinds, whether they're goods and services, whether they're statutory remedies um, or otherwise. These are unique types of mediations. And we saw that as we started 2021, hopefully getting beyond the pandemic, we said, you know, now is the time. Now is the time to put together a powerful group of mediators that can service the wonderful people we talk to on both sides of the aisle. Um, and try to refine uh, the mediations in class actions and mass actions. So you've got uh, my partner, Terry White, my partner, Steve Jaffe, Lance Harkey. These guys have years and years of experience, both mediating, <laughs> but as well being on the, the various sides of this process. So they understand the needs and not only the rights, but the interests that we so often uh, deal with beyond just that which is the law or the facts of the case. So what we want to do is take this, this hour and talk with you about some of the dynamics, some of the structures that we have found effective. Uh, in the course of setting this up, uh, I am actually, uh, ironically, in a class action uh, that I'm going to have to dive off of in order to service them. And I told them I'll take five minutes to do this, but I wanna leave you with a group that can take you through every aspect of this class uh, process and help you uh, understanding that if there's any questions or comments, we'll be glad to take them either during this process or certainly thereafter to be of help to you. So thank you for joining. Uh, I thank the panel for um, leading the way and uh, we look forward to servicing you in the, in the future. Much appreciated. Thank you, Rodney. Good luck with your mediation. Thank you. uh, as I mentioned, uh, we're the uh, mediation group at Upchurch Watson White Max that concentrates on uh, national class actions and mass torts. Uh, we're grateful to have the support of the University of Florida Levin College of Law Institute for Dispute Resolution, who is co sponsoring today's webinar. I want to introduce my uh, co panelists. Uh, I'm grateful to have uh, Terry White with us today. He's a founding partner of Upchurch Watson. He's conducted over 4,000 mediated uh, conferences throughout the state. He's participated by invitation at Harvard University's initial advanced negotiation techniques program with 30 negotiators from around the world. He was requested to lecture at the U.S. 11th Circuit Judges Conference as well as the Georgia Superior Court Judges Conference. He's often invited to lecture at plaintiff and defense legal conferences and has decades of experience uh, settling class and mass uh, torts. So thank you, Terry, for joining us today. Thank you, Lance. Appreciate it. Uh, it's also a pleasure to have Steve Jaffe. Steve Jaffe is a former colleague of mine back when we were both litigating uh, class action cases some years ago. He has uh, expertise in almost every area of the law. He's I've uh, been a, a, a plaintiff's attorney, a defense attorney. He's handled personal injuries, class actions, med mal, breach of contract, consumer fraud, 
insurance cases, complex commercial litigation cases. He settled some of the largest cases in the state of Florida. Uh, Steve has handled uh, class cases for 17 years or more throughout the state. He uh, has joined uh, Upchurch Watson. I've had an opportunity to work with him at Upchurch. He's a tremendous mediator with a wealth of experience, and we welcome you to this panel, Steve, and thank you for being here. Thank you very much. Proud to be here. Uh, so my name is Lance Harkey. I'm a uh, former uh, litigator for some 30 plus years. I was a defense counsel at a large law firm uh, before uh, uh, opening my own practice where I mostly focused on class and mass torts. I've uh, handled hundreds of cases around the country, served as lead counsel in many, many settings, co-lead co counsel, plaintiff's committees, steering committees. I've mediated tons and tons of cases as a litigator. It's my pleasure to be joining up Church Watson as a mediator, and I welcome everyone to today's webinar. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so here we are. This is our seminar, Resolving Class Actions and Mass Claims in 2021, a Civil and Ethical Approach. Lance, before we do that, let me go ahead and, uh, if you could back up a sec, I want to introduce the Center for, for Class Action and Mass Actions and what our vision is going to be. Okay. Yep. Thank you. All right. Um, I think it's important that we, the purpose of this particular seminar is to first introduce to you everybody who is in attendance and to the rest of the country that may see this by uh, review video. Um, we at Upchurch, uh, Watson, White and Max decided to uh, create a center for class action, national class action and mass actions and bring together within our mediator group those who specialize in this area. And within that, we thought the best way to highlight our, our center is uh, to present three or four seminars throughout the year, webinars, lunch and learns. Uh, we, our vision or our goal is to have the top guests uh, come in that we don't always speak. It's going to be guests from around the country that will present topics that are hot, that are topical of great uh, public uh, importance to the practitioners in this space. Uh, the desire is to have uh, a fun, exciting, one-hour, uh, uh, lively discussion of those hot topics so that the practitioners check the calendar, see when it's, it's going to be set, and actually just want to be here, want to hear the new stuff uh, from the top people in the country. So the next, for example, in, in two or three months, I'll be, be the panelist. I'll be the, the director of a class action, mass action, uh, quick lunch and learn, where I'm going to bring in three or four of my friends who are national uh, prominent people within this space. will develop and promote the subject matter of, of the time of, of that when it gets closer. But then Terry will do the same. And he will lead his group and then Lance will do the same and he will lead his group and then Rod will do the same and and so on and so forth. And we'll rotate throughout the year. So anybody out there that thinks that there are hot topics that want to be discussed, that uh, as, as, as we know, this the law in this area changes very quickly. We want to stay ahead of the curve and, and provide to the practitioners in this space everything possible uh, to make sure that they are the best practitioners in the world of this space. So please, we invite you to be part of this um, by attendees and also by substantive uh, interaction with us. And we look forward to doing that. So thanks for being here. Thanks, Lance. You got it, Steve. All right, let's start with confidentiality. Harry, do you want to take that one? Um, I, I think that in terms of of confidentiality, we always have to remember that it starts at the pre-mediation. It doesn't, it doesn't begin when you get together uh, because that's the phase at which you generally are led to help uh, identify what the interests are. It's not, the, it's not necessarily the public pleadings it's not necessarily the public position. It's not necessarily the broadly stated class uh, goal, uh, but rather what's really driving it 
and that confidentiality is just critical um, at at the at the foreground of all of the discussions because that really creates the framework uh, around which you can start to assemble hopefully uh, an agreement and a term sheet. I would also add, that, thank you, Terry. That confidentiality is is what's essential to building uh, trust uh, among the participants in the mediation, uh, particularly in cases that are in the public eye or involve uh, thousands and thousands of class members. It's essential for the uh, the litigants involved to feel comfortable that there's uh, a confidential process in which the parties can be frank and open. And, uh, share their uh, strengths and weaknesses of their cases in order to get, hopefully, to an amicable resolution. So here are the foundation and basic premises for the negotiation. Steve, do you want to speak on that for a moment? So we uh, believe <coughs> that uh, in this space, we are going to get from the practitioners the highest level of professionalism. We understand that from both the consumer base that uh, their interest in protect, the practitioner's interest in protecting the legal rights of the consumer is, is paramount and that uh, they always are going to put their interest first. Similarly, with the, def with the defend corporate defendants, uh, their interest in protecting their business rights uh, is is equally important to them. So it is important that through the pre-mediation process, a level of trust uh, is, is, is gained. Uh, and it's important, we think, as mediators, that the parties trust us and then uh, share with us their thoughts so that we can help the the move the shepherd the, the case through the mediation process um, and and ultimately you always hear uh, rod say uh, nothing is is agreed to till everything's agreed to and with that kind of a concept it allows for us to to get many agreements on certain issues and the more, more we can build on those many agreements then hopefully um, the bigger agreements will will come and ultimately we can get a resolution uh, so that is how we look at the foundation and the basic premise and how we believe to begin uh, negotiations. Absolutely. I think one of the other things is appreciating the uh, cultural uh, dynamic that can be involved. So many of our corporations now are um, multi-national uh, and or international. Uh, and you know, some of the people in Brazil don't take real kindly to the concept of what you're assembling, what uh, you, you want to expose me to what? Well, it's just this one case. Uh, similarly, we have circumstances where uh, you may have uh, holding companies above and beyond who actually are looking over what's going on. They may be located in a place far away. So you do want to have a sense of the, of the dynamics of the culture that you may be interacting with. I think that's very important. I, I, I mediated a case where uh, there were Far Eastern ownership interests, and they have a very, very different view of the American civil justice system. And uh, if you're not aware of it, you're going to miss an opportunity uh, to develop that uh, mutual respect and understanding of of their position and so i think that's really really important terry and more dangerously uh, you know if you stub your toe you may have planted the seed of mistrust through the balance yeah. of the process so. yeah mm -hmm. uh, thank you uh this slide here deals with pre-mediation and as uh you've already heard a little bit pre-mediation is among the most important aspects of resolving a, a large-scale class or mass tort action. Uh, got an excellent question from uh, Patrick Clay, who, uh, uh, like me, was a defense litigator before he uh, joined Morgan & Morgan. 
and he asked uh, uh, why uh, why is often the first several hours of a mediation so unproductive? You know, why is it that uh, in many cases there's not very much movement in the first several hours and the parties are unable to make a lot of progress? And, and one of the answers to that question is exactly this pre-mediation process that you see on the screen here. Uh, the pre-mediation process can help identify who, what the issues are, what the open deal points are, uh, what are the key points that need to be resolved uh, and, and hit up front when you begin the actual mediation. And pre-mediation, from our perspective, often means phone calls in addition to the briefs that are filed by the, submitted by the, by the parties. Uh, the documents that are sent to uh, the mediator for review prior to the mediation, and then phone calls, emails. Uh, you can have several sessions with uh, each side or multiple sides to address what the particular issues are. And as you see on this slide, it's important to identify who the leaders are, who are the people that are going to be, uh, you know, taking charge of negotiating. A, uh, a settlement that would ultimately get approved by the court. Uh, there could be issues involving objectors that or people that you know who have filed other cases and and uh, involving the same subject matter. Uh, so it's critical to identify who the parties are, who the key parties are, who the counsel are. Uh, these phone calls and conferences can raise issues that sometimes when you get to the mediation, you need to all of a sudden scramble to deal with. For example, the, the costs of the administration or the notice of the, of, of the class action. Um, in, in the case of mass torts, who the other players are that might be involved, how to um, interact between the class cases and mass tort cases, uh, and then help define what the parameters of the agenda are to make sure that uh, you know it's a solvable mediation where we can identify who and what uh, the key issues are and how to uh, reach a uh, you know, process by which you can begin to negotiate when you actually get to the mediation. So uh, in our view, pre-mediation is absolutely critical. We encourage uh, the, the litigants who mediate with us to uh, engage in the pre-mediation process. Go ahead, Steve. So uh, Terry and I and, and Lance were talking before we got started and a couple of the, the pre-questions uh, that we'll go over today are all very intertwined. And one of them um, was, you know, what was the biggest mistakes that you've seen in mediations? And the second one was, how do you set an opening demand? <clears throat> By the use of pre-mediation, and we really, really believe in this, um, and some of the practitioners don't want to engage in pre-mediation, but it would address Patrick's question. The more pre-mediation that can get done, will avoid or we can help guide how or what the opening statement will be if in fact there is an opening statement. The more you pre-mediate, the less chance there is a need for an opening statement. But the point is that we can get through some of the preliminary issues with these pre-mediation conferences. And now with Zoom, it's even healthier. We can get people on a pre-mediation conference via Zoom see them in person, whether they're all over the country, and discuss the issues that are bothering, bothering them within the case. The more we do that, the more we do it with the plaintiff's office and establish uh, what their risks are within the case, but the more the, def the, the opening demand can be tailored, and we will discuss that later, but it also uh, will help make the initial couple hours of mediation much more productive. And so we would encourage everybody to open their other arms and their ears uh, to the, the pre-mediation conference. It will help streamline mediation so that we do address Patrick's issue, and that is that it is productive in the first few hours. To that end, I think that it is important to have a good sense of not only counsel, but also the, the parties who will be present when you're dealing on, uh, as it relates to the defense side, the, you know, sometimes a, a critical question is who, who, who will be there and why? Uh, the why may actually give you an indication of what the interest is that's being affected. 
Um, another important question for purposes of parties and councils, who's not going to be there and why? Which may also flesh out you know, things that can be in play and things that can't be in play. Just nuances that come into, come into the process. Right, and then absolutely, Terry, in the case of class actions, the question is often raised, uh, you know, does the class representative need to be in attendance at the mediation? Is, is uh, the representative, uh, you know, a, a putative plaintiff or an individual plaintiff? Is the settlement going to move into an individual direction as opposed to a uh, negotiated class action? And uh, a lot of these things, uh, you know, are way better to resolve uh, in the pre-mediation process so that at the actual mediation, you, you can know, and some of these that have a, a life of their own, you know, the one I was dealing with started back in 2014, um, you know, the, the, uh, the individuals uh, who were the class reps, this had been a tortured path. And there were claims for fees coming back, and those fees had obviously morphed into seven figures. And uh, you know, so it, it, while while the uh, class rep is is a required item, they do have a, a different risk uh, that can be uh, serious. So, Absolutely. You can also have issues involving uh, defendants. You can have multiple defendants and a pre-mediation mediation could be helpful to address uh, some of the issues that defendants have among each other. Uh, share, cost sharing, uh, allocation of, of risk. Uh, and similarly with plaintiffs, you could have competing plaintiffs class actions where an important issue for the pre-mediation stage is, you know, can you get these lawyers and parties together and on the same page in a mediation that resolves all of the cases that would obviously be more useful from the defendant's perspective. So uh, these are issues that can be fleshed, fleshed out pre-mediation, which is why it's such an important part of the process. All right, let's move on. Okay, so here we have the issue sequencing, question of joint caucuses, and separate caucuses. So, the, again, everything's going to flow from the pre-mediation conference. What we learn from the pre-mediation conference <clears throat> will obviously help us in issue sequencing. Um, again, understanding that nothing's agreed to till everything's agreed to. If we can get some of the low-hanging fruit issues off the table and get those agreed to early, uh, that is a very important process uh, to us and a very it, it, it creates momentum whether that is whether there are joint caucuses I think what we mean there is, is is you know are you going to give opening statements many many times as a practitioner these cases have been heavily litigated and um, quite candidly an opening statement uh, could to could uh, uh, disrupt the flow of mediation um, you know, we, we, we talked about one of the, Terry and I talked about one of the, the biggest mistakes, and, and, and we can find that in a joint caucus when, uh, well, actually, I'll, let me allow Terry to, to jump in there. Terry, talk about the, the, your thoughts on the joint caucus and the biggest mistakes that uh, some practitioners can make there. Well, the, you know, for me, the biggest mistake is that uh, you may, uh, there, there can be a tendency to drop into the weeds. Uh, and once that happens, you have just taken your eye off the bigger ball and you don't have your broader perspective about why you're here, what you're trying to accomplish. Um, and so I, I think that that's uh, an important um, aspect. Also, I think that the, the caucuses, um, and I, I think it's very important that people in the mediation process know that you may pull people at somewhat random times that they may come and go. And that's because you may need to have a conversation that deals with some legal impediment, uh, getting close to some ethical issue or whatever, and kind of handling what that item is. So these joint conferences are not just one side and the other side can be 
pulled out of a particular group to make sure that the um, the whole the whole thing is coordinated. And Terry and Steve, what are what are your views on uh, a presentation, a PowerPoint at the joint caucus? Because sometimes, uh, for example, plaintiffs want uh, the defendant to see the strength of their case, and they want to present all the bad evidence and all of the risk factors uh, the way they want to present it at the beginning. Similarly, sometimes defendants uh, want uh, to highlight the problems with class certification, what the issues are with um, common issues or damages, and uh, they want an opportunity to just directly tell the plaintiff's lawyer how bad their case is. So what, what are your thoughts on this? Terry, you want to jump in first? You know, my thought is that um, it has, it, the pre-mediation hopefully has dealt with this issue. You know, the question is, what do you want to accomplish? What do you want to accomplish? If you want to cause somebody to bow up and say, really, you think that's what's going to happen? You want to make the corporate defendant who came there with a design to find a way suddenly decide, I'm going to squash you like a bug. I've had about all the fun with you I want. And so, you know, to me, that aspect is important pre-mediation so that I can then kind of cull down that position so that I don't lose it. I got it. I, I, I hear it. Here, this is a risk factor, but it's not a detailed risk factor. It's a category risk factor. And I think that's how you, that's how you deal with it. I would I discourage it in the joint aspect. Uh, in a joint session, I would have hoped that it would have occurred separately, but brought together by the mediator during the pre-meeting. What do you think about that, Steve? Yeah, I, to the practitioners out there, understand that you're at mediation, not only because you're court ordered, but hopefully because there's some mutual desire at some level to seek resolution. If in fact the, the, the goal is to seek resolution, then a chest pounding session of how great your case is and how bad the opposition case is absolutely will cause the first few hours to be very, very contentious and slow moving and have to uh, uh, allow us, the mediators, to try to bring things uh, back to normal. If you care that much about expressing your position to the opposition via PowerPoint, I certainly would encourage you sending the PowerPoint a month before mediation to the opposition council. Let them see it. If you feel that strongly about your position, you've already drafted uh, motion practice. It's all exposed. It's all there. And then in the joint caucus, you can reference your prior uh, uh, PowerPoint that you've been you sent to all the decision makers, um, but do it in a much softer way. In essence, saying, listen, I'm, I, I recognize exposure, but your case isn't what you think it is. We've highlighted that in our PowerPoint, but today we're going to let the mediator do his job and you're going to hear some of the things that that, that uh, we expressed in the PowerPoint. And I think that way it's a much, your message is given, but much softer in its in its purpose. Yeah, I agree with both of you. It's often backfires to start off uh, too hot at the beginning of a joint caucus. And, you know. yeah, I mean, if your goal is to have uh, uh, three different three different days of mediation and and uh, maybe even three different type of sessions over the course of six months, then then yes, okay, I understand it. Uh, but uh, understand what you're doing. Issue sequencing. This, this is what I was, yeah, go ahead. You want to take, take this one, Lance? No, uh, I was just going to highlight some of the, the, the issues uh, dealing with sequencing, uh, the definition, the scope of what the case is that you're there to resolve, how large of a case, who does it involve. Uh, to me, uh, notice is always a key issue in class action resolution. Uh, and you should come into the mediation with a back of the envelope estimate of what uh, the notice costs are going to be, uh, what form of notice, the administration costs, the scope and the costs, uh, you know, some concept of what type of uh, claim 
process is going to be involved, who's going to be handling it, whether the defendant is going to be involved in that. Uh, certainly the type of relief uh, where you involves non-monetary relief that's critical to get off uh, get on the table at the pre-mediation stage if you can, if you're asking the defendant to uh, change its practices, or issue a statement, or engage in a particular type of conduct or cease conduct that it had engaged in, um, that's critical. Monetary relief obviously is critically important. Uh, the question of incentive awards, uh, there's been a, a recent shift in the law in the 11th circuit anyway with respect to incentive award payments to class representatives that issue is still uh, ongoing um, there's a, a question about whether or not incentive awards to uh, representative plaintiffs are legal in the 11th circuit uh, there are different ways that i've seen in mediations that this has been addressed while we're in the middle of this uncertainty uh, you could, uh, for example, have a conditional fee award that's uh, conditioned upon the uh, resolution of the issue ultimately before the 11th or the Supreme Court. Uh, that's one example. I've seen uh, court orders in recent cases here in the Southern District of Florida that have um, uh, um, set forth a, a, a method by which an incentive award could be paid upon the resolution of the issue uh, further by the 11th Circuit. Uh, so that issue obviously has to be addressed. Question of attorney's fees and costs, that's you know something that comes up after the resolution of the case in chief. It's uh, obviously always something that's on the mind of both the defendants and plaintiffs. Uh, the 11th Circuit has very specific rules governing how uh, attorney's fees and costs are paid in class actions. The court has to approve the attorney's fee and costs request. Uh, depending on the resolution, you have a percentage of the common fund, uh, which can vary. Um, but um, uh, and then there's settlements that deal with load stars, question of multipliers. There are often uh, settlements that uh, have statutory components to it where fees are, are set by statute and that can impact the multiplier. Uh, so all of these issues have to have to be addressed and in a in a proper order so that you can reach an amicable resolution of the case. Uh, Terry or Steve, you have anything to add on that? The only thing I would say is that it you know it it doesn't help to be naive that the first part is going to in large part determine the second part. And what am I talking about? I'm talking about whatever issues it is that you have decided you're going to have as a critical terms of the agreement. They they create whatever the value is. And so the value then drops down for that last issue that you need to deal with, which is, is the fee. And so, you know, absent a appreciation of, you know, these components, you're going to have a hard time analyzing the value that uh, may be uh, a factor as it relates to the attorney's fee issue. So you got to look you gotta look down the road. <laughs> my, my, my comment on this slide is this is the quintessential uh, um, cheat sheet for a class action settlement. Um, and certainly I would encourage the preparation, as you said, back of the envelope on notice costs. Um, but, but if you don't have the definition and scope, you can't really know the size of the class. So again, it's about that pre-mediation uh, work that we do. It's about the pre-mediation discovery that's been exchanged to, to help uh, give comfort to both sides as to the scope of the case and the potential exposure, which then drives the type of notice and the cost of notice and administration. Um, so um, just a quick aside, I think one of the mistakes I've seen by some practitioners, and certainly not all, uh, is lack of preparation. Don't let the other side outwork you. You got to know what you're doing. You got to have contact with your notice administrators, have an idea of scope on both sides uh, so that the first few hours of mediation are not spent contacting notice administrators. I've actually had that occur. So to Patrick's point where why is things take so long? 
because sometimes that that work is being done live, which is just not good lawyering. We should do it before. So those are my thoughts on this. Absolutely. And sometimes the, the scope can expand, you know, and the pre-mediation can help that. You can have an issue where the defendant or the plaintiffs want to move from a state class to a national class, from a resolution of a particular slate of mass tort cases to a larger slate, uh, from a, uh, it can, it can narrow too, from a, a class settlement to an individual settlement. Right. So, you know, as you say, the, the earlier that this can be vetted and, you know, addressed, the, the better the actual mediation is gonna go. Here we go, go ahead, Terry or Steve, wanna take uh, caucuses? Gary, I'm curious on your thoughts on 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 this. This is something that you've uh, you've gotten fond of with the breakouts of individual people's people within uh, each caucus room. Well, you, you, the, you know, the question oftentimes is, you know, who who do you want? You want the deal maker. It's it's easy to bust the deal. It's easy to throw an impediment in. And so sometimes you simply need to get. A, two two personalities together from different sides of the case and and they can they can work better now if you want to have a conflagration okay fine go go bring your your two litigators but identify who your your settlement counsel really are and then what is the level of involvement of the actual defendant in the cases because it, is, it, it has happened more times than one where I've been, if not asked, where the president or the CEO says, Terry, I want to talk to so-and-so. Perfect. You can't do it prematurely. Generally, you got to be very careful. It has to be done with a appreciation and understanding of the, of the client, the attorney-client relationship. They don't want to step on anybody. Uh, so, but those opportunities to have separate caucuses is is uh you know the variety of them uh and the purpose of them is is somewhat incalculable but any combination can happen and sometimes it's just one person um sometimes you can send somebody to a room and never go back but okay <laughs> i discourage that practice, so. removing the uh, the word the, the bad party so to speak no, Lance, I think Terry's addressed that, and uh, it's a it's a very uh, personal style and very case specific, but uh, it does bring the point out that you got to be nimble, you got to adjust, and sometimes private meetings and private conversations uh, will help bring about uh, a strategic type of uh, analysis of the case and, and be able to build on that to get the ultimate resolution. Yeah, and as I mentioned earlier, the uh, occasionally you have defendants who are at odds with each other, multiple parties who uh, insurance company and a, and a corporate defendant, uh, multiple corporate defendants who uh, you need to engage in a mini mediation among them uh, before you can, you know, get back to the plaintiff side to discuss uh, how to, you know, resolve the case. Very good. Post mediation, similar to pre mediation, uh, this is a critically important stage because if you're, you know, go ahead, Steve. No, I don't want to interrupt you. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say if you're, uh, you know, if you're in a uh, large scale class or mass tort case, it's uh, often the case that you need a significant amount of time after the mediation to ultimately con con conclude and bring the actual case to a resolution that's approved by the court uh, so i've heard this i've heard this multiple times first mediation is to exchange some body blows and to soften up uh, each other uh, and then they go back to their respective corners meet with the parties that are important and then um, adjust potentially adjust their positions um, all of us have been in mediations that are multi-day or multi-stops uh, and then you come back a few months later. What occurs post-mediation from a mediator's perspective is very important 
because we want to continue the momentum. We want to make sure that the things that were discussed within mediation uh, are being addressed post mediation. Uh, I recently was involved in a, in a case in which I was asked as the mediator to join and speak to the count, the actual class reps. There was 20 or 30 of them uh, to to spend a few hours with them because, you know, there was some very, very relevant potential individual issues that were starting to fester. Uh, and that will control whether or not uh, uh, the case continues as a class case or is it was it, is there a pivot and does it move into a mass action? Um, and that, that that's one of the questions that we have. How do you how do you how do you know when it's when it happens? And generally that's controlled by the parties. But the point is these post mediations can move a class, a potential class a case, a punitive class case into a mass action, which may be what defendant wants. Uh, and, and resolution, and both parties can be uh, satisfied with that type of a movement, depending on what the issues are. So post-mediation, strategically placed uh, calls, keeping confidentiality open, meeting with all participants, if it's class members, uh, to try to bring about the, the resolution. And mediators that are, that are um, married to the concept of pre-mediation and post-mediation, is a is a in my humble opinion a better way to look at this process than just a one day mediation. Excellent point. Uh, there's also the case of uh, documents that are being exchanged, settlement drafts, term sheets, disputes that arose that arise among the parties that uh, will often require the mediator to uh, step in and help um, adjudicate, help resolve, uh, so that you can get on to the next stage of the approval process. Uh, so post mediation is, is almost as important as the pre and the actual mediation and bringing a case to a successful resolution. I think to that end it's important to have a, you know, a, a clear focus when you leave. What, why do you need to leave? You need to leave because something is not adequately clear, whether it's a risk, whether it's exposure, it's a something. And so you need to make sure that you know when you make that post-mediation call, how's that How's that going? Where, where, where did that go down where you thought it was going to go or did it go over here? And so, but having a clear focus of here's our area of uncertainty and that's why we're continuing to another day. Right. Pardon post-mediation process, one last thought based on what I just heard from Terry. Uh, occasionally, the mediators are required to, uh, you know, submit a affidavit or a declaration to address some of the issues that have arose in the post-mediation process. There's a dispute about whether or not the negotiations were arm's length, and there's ethical considerations that govern what mediators kind of can't say in that circumstance, but uh, that also folds into the post-mediation process and brings us to this next issue, which is the use of an ethicist. And frequently, it's the case, and I know, Steve, you have some personal experience with this, uh, that an ethicist is required uh, or desirable to step in and weigh in on some of the ethical issues that arise in class and mass tort resolution. That can be communications with absent class members, it can be litigation funding questions, it could be questions of the payment of attorney's fees relative to the distribution to the class. There's a whole host of ethical issues that arise that uh, it might make sense for the parties to uh, use an ethicist. Steve, why don't you tell us about your own personal experience? So, uh, Rod was the mediator on this particular case. We call it Fresco there in the slide just to trigger my memory because he actually reminded me of this and this is uh, probably 20 years ago uh, we were mediating a case and there were some some high high level ethical issues um that that were concerned both parties and the the, the thought was okay how are we going to handle this you know, we can get a declaration from from the mediator but what's better than that and what was better than that was finding an academic at a university who was an expert on the subject matter that we were litigating and have them review the documents and have them a comment 
and opine on their belief of this resolution and where the resolution fell as well uh, as it relates to whether it was uh, handled in an ethical uh, manner based upon the pleadings and the result was it one that the court should take uh, consideration of and, and, and approve and so we used it as an academic since that time it's used in notice administrators are filing declarations on the issue of reach um, and then obviously the the what will be a slide coming up is the declaration of the mediator that it was an arm length arm's length transaction so again this is a higher level of of use of the of the final approval papers it, it does lead to excess uh, excess it does lead to increased costs um, but at the end of the day, with the proliferation of objectors, I think this is a great uh, idea and should be used uh, more by practitioners. Absolutely. Uh, good point, Steve. Uh, let's talk about the term sheet. You have a settlement in, in theory, in concept. Uh, Terry and Steve, how do you, uh, you know, help uh, the process by moving uh, it into writing and the development of a term sheet. I'll let Steve go first. My my point is here. Here is in that pre-mediation conference with both parties. I want the conversation to be discussed uh, that a working draft of a term sheet should be constantly being used during the caucuses and during the sessions, so that. We're not at the end of the day, 11 o'clock at night, saying, okay, now that we have the handwritten stuff, let's, let's sit down and, and write it up. No, it should be absolutely drafted along the way. And in fact, some areas can be shared during the process between the parties so that at the end of the day, it's ready for execution. Um, and so term sheet development should be done early, often adjusted, and be ready to be executed. It's just, it's just good lawyering. That's well, good lawyering in it it also sets a mind step. It, it helps to reinforce what the object is. The object is to have an agreement. And so to that end, you know, it's it's somewhat preemptive when you say, well, what's the term sheet look like? But we didn't mediate the case. No, no, no. What's a, what, what do you think this term sheet's going to look like? It's, you know, it's like jury instructions. You know, if you know what your jury instructions are, then you know how you're going to advance your argument. So it's sort of the same same sort of thing. <clears throat> Excellent points. I, I would also add it, it helps uh, the parties move from a adversarial process to a cooperative collaborative process. The earlier that you can open up a term sheet, stick it up on a board or get the parties around the table looking at it, uh, it helps to make concrete what the remaining deal points are, if there are any, uh, what the ultimate wording of a settlement agreement is going to look like and, and focuses the the litigants on resolving a case as opposed to continuing to litigate it. Absolutely. Steve, go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It works in the context. Yeah, and, and Matt, uh, Lance, I want to be cognizant of the time too, because we, we're running up against the hour. I want to leave a little time for questions if there are any, but uh, we just touched on this. Um, affidavit uh, of the mediator i don't think testimony is 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 appropriate uh but an affidavit or a declaration of an arm's length that the, that all the the salient issues were handled as arm length transaction and more importantly that no fees and and uh, uh cost discussion was handled until the body of the case uh had been had been agreed to um and uh, again an often underused tool to help the court uh is my opinion Thank you. Uh, we do have a couple of questions, and uh, why don't we uh, see if, what you all think of one? Uh, you know. Yeah, how uh, about this one? Uh, the one that number five was uh, one that we were uh, looking at earlier, and the question was, what if two cases uh, by two different counselors are filed? Basically, we call it the filing over of. A very common, sad practice in the class action world. Um, somebody picks up from PACER in action, they immediately file over them. And, and then there's this hustle to, to, to get leadership. If it grows big enough, it becomes a, uh, 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 
MDL case, but if it doesn't, then you have these smaller competing kit class actions. Well, that's not good for anybody. Certainly, that should be dealt with prior to mediation. That's why, again, the pre-mediation conferences are important. We maybe can be able to bring the parties together, uh, and, and there is a, a shotgun wedding, uh, marriage, so to speak, but uh, it needs to be done before mediation because I don't think there's any defendant that's going to want to potential. Oh, I shouldn't say it that way. Yeah. The, defend, the risk is the defendant can settle one and the second person's out. And right. if it's that similar, then, then they may, and the defendant may go where they perceive the low-hanging fruit to be. Uh, yeah. And that's not necessarily good. So go ahead. No, I, I, I totally agree. I, I think that's where premiation is also so critical. You can learn from the parties that maybe they don't want the other uh lawyers and law firms and other cases involved and they they want to go settle this their state class action or their you know action and then um you know deal with the objectors deal with the other parties down the road uh it, it depends on on the particular set of facts all uh, right the next, next one go ahead a I'm great sorry. go ahead steve no i wanted to address one uh, question that that uh uh, Gene Martin sent in, um, and that was how do you set a good opening demand? And this is a pet peeve of mine, and I know most mediators. So, Terry, why don't you jump in on this one? The, the main thing is that for it to have intellectual integrity and provide a basis to have a discussion, it has to be anchored in something. There has to be a methodology. It has to hook to something. If it's simply, this is what I want, it's going to have to be some kind of eight figures, whatever, well, where the hell did you pick that from? You know, attach it to something because we have 40 of these, 4,400 of these, and we've got this, and this category in and of itself could drop us to here. So, and you can flash up, you, know, you can flash the, the, oh, this is how bad it could get. Well, we're not going to talk about that. We're going to talk about managing that problem. We're not going to talk about the specter of how good or how bad it could be. I can squash you like a bug. I can get a gazillion dollars. Okay, fine. Now that we got that out of the way, you know, let's kind of deal with it. So that's my thought. Steve, any thoughts on opening demand? Yeah, uh, no, Terry's is the best. Okay. And I, I've made a few notes, and I think it has to be rational and reasonable. I think that's another way of saying exactly what. What Terry said, if you're hell bent on showing or demanding 100 percent of the potential exposure damages, to me, that's a waste of time. All right. You know, everyone knows that you want to highlight it and say that's your expense, that's your potential exposure of, of damages. Fine. We're going to take in the risk factors of this case. We all recognize that there's risk in every case, but in this particular case, and we're adjusting it down for these reasons. Um, so those are my thoughts. You've got to just be realistic. You can't go in there and, and ask for the moon, the stars, and uh, and the air flight up there. I, I just I think those are excellent points. I just want to add. I think it uh, on the defense side, you have that issue where the defendant comes in and says, "Listen, we're never settling this as a class case. That's that's just not happening. Uh, we'll talk about an individual resolution. We're not changing our practices. We're not going before the court." Uh, it it has, sets the same sort of tone uh, that can be very counterproductive, uh, just as much as a plaintiff coming in and say, I want my punitive damages. My punitive damages has to be part of the resolution of this case. You know, it it's, uh, doesn't lead to uh, an amicable resolution. Let me go uh, ahead and address the question, uh, Lance, that came from the audience that uh, has been partially responded to. Will you be offering CLE credit for your lunch and learn programs? The answer to that is yes. And then the next question was, will it be in, in multiple states? Our goal since our since we're, we're a, a national type of uh, uh, mediation center would be yes to have to have uh, uh, CLE credit for multiple states. And that's uh, we're going. This particular one today is not, but the goal is to have expanded uh, um, national speakers. And that would qualify for CLE credit around the country. So yes, that's our goal for sure. What, one other question before we break, and you can see up here that the uh, Florida Bar course number uh, is identified, and I'll just go ahead and read it into uh, so so folks can can hear it as well. Two one zero three one seven zero N. 
And uh, one last question that I, I just wanted to address that, that uh, came before the seminar began is how can a solo practitioner get involved in mass tort cases? I love that question because I actually have personal experience with this uh, and, and um, can tell you that uh, the, well, obviously the first thing to do is have a client, you know, uh, if you have a client who's had a, uh, a bad, uh, you know, experience with a medical device or had a bad experience with a drug, had a bad experience with a uh, particular um, uh, consumer product, uh, you know, that's the first step. Uh, the next step from my perspective is to reach out to other lawyers who um, handle these types of cases who are involved in these types of mass torts and find out whether or not there's been an MDL, MDL already formed, find out whether or not their case is on file, whether or not um, the cases have been concentrated in a particular area, whether leadership has been developed, and then reach out to those lawyers and, and form relationships that lead to your involvement in these cases. Uh, you know, so that, that's my two cents on how to get involved in mass tort cases. Steve and Terry. Yeah, so having, having been a practitioner in that space before I moved over to mediation, I made a couple of notes. Some of them are a little sarcastic. Uh, be careful what you wish for. Uh, you better be doing some good screening. And uh, I put $5 signs up for advertising. Uh, but most important, uh, if you do uh, obtain good clients in that space, you better have a trusted relationship with someone who has uh, advanced their practice practice in the mass tort space. Uh, otherwise, you'll be eaten up like a bug and spit out. Couldn't agree more, Steve. Excellent advice. Steve just uh, always under he, Steve just always understates things. It's hard to figure out. <laughs> I, I, he was only out of five on that one. Uh, <laughs> Listen, I, I, on behalf of all of us at uh, Upchurch Watson, we want to thank you for participating in our uh, webinar today. As, as Steve and Terry mentioned, we have more on the way. Uh, we look forward to uh, being of service to you in uh, the national class, mass tort, or any type of case that uh, you're looking for a mediator to help resolve. Uh, please uh, watch your emails. We'll be sending out more uh, dates with uh, more webinars to come, Lunch and Learn series, as Steve mentioned, and we thank you all for being here. Terry or Steve, do you have anything to add before we uh, break for the day? We're excited, about, we're excited about the center, the launch of the center. Uh, we're excited about uh, bringing top people from around the country to you uh, to help you become better practitioners, uh, and please reach out to us with topical stuff you want discussed. We'll supply people We'll get it done. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Have a great day.